Thank you. Um, it's great to be here this evening. I think, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's always a pleasure to be on the forefront, especially when we're looking at new chapters, especially on whether it be on hydrocephalus, uh, chiari, or syringomyelia. Um, I just get to introduce everyone this evening, which makes my job very simple. Um, and straightforward. Uh, leave it up to the speakers uh, to share their thoughts uh, about Chiari malformations, both from the clinical as well as uh, the research aspects. Um, and, and as you know, as we heard earlier, I think um, we know a lot about Chiari malformations, but I think we have a long way to go because um, uh, not every Chiari uh, child or adult patient is the same. I, I, don't, I don't even think the imaging is uh, consistent and uh, there, are many, uh, there are many families that uh, seek multiple opinions before making the decision to proceed with uh, uh, the surgery for, for the QRE or for the syringomyelia or, or the scoliosis. Um, yeah, I think in one, one of my lectures I, I said that if the Chiari is the great imitator, you can almost imitate any disease out there, and sometimes it's hard to make the diagnosis. Um, and even when we do make the diagnosis, uh, there's still a lot of controversy as to what the best approach is uh, for in terms of the surgical management. And what do we do with these uh, children after they've been... Uh, after they've had surgery and have had uh, progressive symptoms. So hopefully we'll learn a little uh, this evening about the, what we uh, consider Chiari malformations as well as the research. Uh, the first speaker will be Dr. Nir Shimoni, who will be speaking for Dr. Carey uh, as she was, uh, she's still stuck in the operating room. So he will come up and get, share his thoughts uh, about the clinical aspects uh, for Chiari malformations. Yep. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm going to give you a few perspectives, uh, basically on a, based on the Dr. Carey uh, vast experience with dealing with Chiari malformation. I'm going to talk about a little bit about the malformation itself and the different uh, modality of treatment that we can give uh, to the patients. So, in this talk, we're going to go through several topics. This is the, a very long list. I'm going to try and go through all of it. So eventually, when you talk about Chiari malformation, uh, it's a congenital anomaly, and the percentage of familial uh, anomaly is fairly low. Uh, usually, we just found it uh, as long uh, in kids and adults as well, usually in females. Uh, it can be as a secondary problem after a lumbar peritoneal shunts uh, or as a result of craniosynostosis or scalbi synostosis uh, and in several diseases as well, as you heard before, like uh, rickets, allodownless, and achondroplasia. In terms of history, in the late uh, 19th century, uh, already been talked about Chiari. Chiari himself uh, uh, proposed uh, the mechanism in uh, 1891, and ever since it's been developed uh, more and more, and even nowadays, we're still debating about the best treatment we can give in different forms of Chiari. In terms of the definition, uh, I guess a lot of you heard the numbers already. So the classical definition is about uh, tonsillar descent, and you can see the mouse head here. So in terms of anatomy, we have the brainstem around here going into the spinal cord where there is the small brain, the cerebellum, and the tonsils. In Chiari, the classic Chiari, the tonsils just go down and compact this transition from the brain to the spinal cord, which causes uh, mainly most of the problems. So the number that uh, most of us quote is between 5 to 7 millimeters uh, to be diagnosed as a radiology uh, diagnosis of uh, Chiari can be associated with serins, can be associated with uh, scoliosis. So 
So the different uh, radiographic criteria uh, can be starting from what I just mentioned regarding the tonsillar uh, descent, but can go as well with a very uh, low volume of posterior fossa. Everything is too compact, so it's being pushed downwards. Uh, and causing a crowding of the cranial cervical, the transition zone between the brain and the spinal cord, um, and eventually uh, uh, less space for the subarachnoid space. Uh, and all of that can cause uh, the Chiari malformation uh, symptoms. Sometimes uh, we can relate to even less descent if we have more uh, symptoms or anomalies uh, in regard to the Chiari. One of the most important things that the clinician, the nurse surgeon, look at when we diagnose first uh, a Chiari is the position of the brainstem or the bones that create the skull base and how much it invaginate or protruding like into the uh, down phase of the brainstem. That can cause a lot of uh, mechanism problem uh, and relate to one of uh, the problem that we're going to talk about later on in Chiari. There's a lot of study that we use. We basically base our uh, um, diagnosis by uh, clinical symptoms and MRI these days. Uh, one of the features that uh, came along uh, in the recent years is the scening, uh, which means that we try to figure out if we see more, uh, if we see enough fluid coming around uh, the spinal cord and the brainstem. Um, you can see here, you can see it uh, pretty much okay on the screen. Uh, this is, around here is the brain, and we can see the white here and here are actually the CSF or the fluids. Uh, so we basically wanted to see fluids like we see on the front of the brainstem. We want to see it as well as here, going from the brain through the fourth ventricle and going down to the uh, around the spinal cord. We can see that it's, look, we see some fluids uh, on the back as well on the front, but when we have Chiari, sometimes we cannot see that. So this is the same patient, it's the same uh, kid. We can see here quite nice flow on the front of the uh, brainstem, but we cannot see it on the back. So it can be helpful. It's been shown before that uh, it's not with 100% correlation, so we cannot rely on this study to make a diagnosis, but we, one of the tools that can help us when we're debating it regarding uh, what treatment to choose for the kid. So people are talking about Chiari 1, Chiari 2, Chiari 3. Nowadays, there are even Chiari 0, 1.5, and so on. This is not a staging or grading system. This is actually different pathologies, uh, most likely with different origin and maybe different embryological reason. We don't know yet, but uh, we know already that for the main three, uh, so the Kirai one, that the one, the one that we're going to talk about today mainly, uh, the descent of five to seven millimeter, Kiari two associated with uh, myeloma uh, and Kiari three, is more related to uh, downwards, more severely downwards of uh, brainstem particle and posterior fossa, uh, including occipital encephalocele. Today we're going to focus on Chiari 1, uh, which is the major uh, problem. Uh, we can see here in the picture that some of these pathologies can be seen already when uh, in uterus during pregnancy. So Chiari 0 just uh, in very, very short. Uh, we don't see the descent, but we do see uh, severe syringohydromalia. Uh, treatment eventually and uh, decision making very, very much like Chiari 1. So we talked about the pathogenesis is different uh, from Chiari 2 and Chiari 3. Uh, and Several mechanisms uh, were proposed along the history and still are regarding maybe uh, the posterior fossa, the back of the head is too small to have all the parts, so some of the parts are being pushed down uh, and we need to open that in order to 
make these symptoms go away. Um, some uh, in regard to bony malformation or abnormality at the junction of the cranial cervical uh, between the brain and the spinal cord. But eventually, we basically still don't really know what are, are the real reasons for formation of Chiari 1. Um, several other diseases uh, or uh, pathologies were associated with Chiari malformation, especially Chiari 1. Um, most of the kids with Chiari 1 uh, malformation uh, are normal beside this pathology. Sometimes there is a relation to craniosynostosis, stealth cord, or other uh, bony malformations, and sometimes to hydrocephalus as well as a secondary or primary uh, reason uh, in Chiari. Syringal hydromelia, in, in short, it means that there are fluids inside this, uh, the spinal cord uh, where it shouldn't be or not in that amount. Uh, it's fairly uh, common in Chiari 1. Uh, the numbers that the old literature is quoting is about 50 to 75 percent. We see much less than that. And uh, I'm going to talk later on that uh, large publication in recent years showed that the numbers are much less than 50 percent, uh, let to know, uh, uh, to say uh, 75 percent. Um, when you have syrinx, usually you have symptoms. And the other thing that go um, with high percentage with carry one is scoliosis. So in terms of theory, why do you have syrinx uh, when you have carry one uh, There are a long history, uh, uh, several thought about that. Uh, the one that most advocate today, the one that all feel already uh, and mean of uh, 1990 suggested regarding the fact that when you look at the anatomy, the CSF need to be pushed down around the spinal cord. When there is too much pressure, the CSF, instead of going down, is being pushed into the spinal cord through a small opening that you have along the road. And that causes accumulation of fluid inside the spinal cord. So if that's the mechanism, if you're going to relieve the pressure, the constraint around here, you're going to relieve the problem and, res and solve the syrinx, or at least make it easier. I'm going to make some progress here. In terms of typical symptoms, like you just heard uh, Dr. Jalo, uh, Chiari can be uh, um, the greater uh, imitator. A lot of symptoms can go with Chiari, some of them related to uh, neurological uh, uh, symptoms and some can be even not related at all. Um, Dr. Kerr usually used uh, one of her examples about a kid that uh, had lose uh, weight more and more and more. He had uh, a lot of uh, GI exams, a lot of uh, um, studies rely, uh, in relation to his uh, uh, GI tracts uh, and eventually somehow someone decided because he had also headaches to scan and found Chiari uh, 1 malformation. Uh, she operated on him and slowly he regained weight because he eventually just stopped having nausea and from time to time vomiting. So we got to be alert because a lot of symptoms can be related to Criari 1. But one thing we need to remember that usually with these kids, the neurological exam uh, will be normal. So I put here a very long list of symptoms and signs because the list is very long and it very the variety is, is, is very, very uh, uh, big. Uh, it can be from moderate to sensory to uh, drop attacks like, like epilepsy, but it's not epilepsy, uh, uh, to chronic hiccups, to uh, sleep disturbances. Uh, it can be very vast. So this is one of the options that when uh, usually the pediatrician do his diagnosis and later on the neuro neurologist or neurosurgeon uh, need to take into, uh, into mind when dealing with these kids. One other example, a kid that we uh, lately operated on, 
was uh, with some kind of speech delay. It's not was it wasn't really a speech delay. It was more a problem with articulation or walking with uh, his nasopharynx, his mouth after surgery. Uh, he was uh, two and a half years old after surgery. Uh, he started to uh, speak not so slowly, but two weeks after he started to speak. So we can see these rare uh, examples, but it's there. So it can be incidental finding as well. Uh, patients, kids and adults as well with uh, asymptomatic Chiari, meaning somehow after trauma or not, uh, the patient being uh, diagnosed by CT or MRI with uh, tonsillar descent doesn't mean you need to operate, doesn't mean you need to do anything. Uh, asymptomatic patient usually will remain asymptomatic. You just need to follow them and to check carefully if there are really no symptoms. Um, especially in the young population, tonsillar can go down and then go up again. So radiogra radiogra radiographic uh, diagnostic of uh, Chiari doesn't mean that the patient is going into the OR. In terms of surgical candidates, in short, they have symptoms. They have rad radiographic uh, picture of Chiari and they have symptoms. The classic one will be headaches, scoliosis, or syrinx. Uh, maybe something that will relate to some kind of uh, developmental delay, unusual symptoms, like we talked, uh, like the example I just gave. But one thing to bear in mind, it doesn't relate to autism, to behavioral problem, meaning sometimes a kid with autism can have Chiari and the Chiari uh, operation will resolve his headaches, but the autism will stay. So the Chiari will not take away this problem. Sometimes go together, but will not fix these problems. In terms of Chiari 0 and 1.5, the decision-making process and the surgery is pretty much the same. Like in Chiari 1, we're going to talk about the surgery short. In short, Chiari 2, the one with the myeloma meningocele, uh, rarely will go to uh, really uh, doing uh, foron migraine decompression and the classic Chiari operation. Uh, and Chiari 3, um, we usually do need to do surgery very shortly after birth uh, because of the severe occipital uh, malformation. Um, asymptomatic patient, as I mentioned, doesn't mean that they need to go to surgery. This is a big study that uh, was being done in uh, Johns Hopkins. A uh, very big cohort of MRI uh, being looked for the prevalence and uh, what is the chances to develop some kind of uh, symptoms and syrinx and eventually only one patient developed syrinx. So remember the number that I gave before about the 50 to 75 percent that the number that been caught for years in the literature apparently it's not that high eventually. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the surgical technique. So as we just mentioned, uh, eventually the main problem is the compactness, the less of uh, volume at the junction of the craniocervical uh, between the brain and the spinal cord. So we have few options for us to uh, relieve this compactness. Uh, one of them will be uh, opening up the bones around it. The bones will be uh, C1, the posterior arch of C1, and the posterior part of the occipital bone, which cover the foramen magnum. Uh, and a more aggressive option will be to open the dura and maybe to shrink the, the, this tonsil that went down and make them smaller or let them go up. There is a very big debate regarding the need to open dura still. Uh, and we are here in, uh, in Johns Hopkins, we are involved, one of my colleague, going to, uh, Dr. Tewitt, going to talk about it. Uh, we're involved in one of the uh, studies relating if we need to open a uh, dura or just do the body decompression. Uh, from this picture here, you can see that the level, you see it's not very really clear, but this is the foramen magnum. This, is, this line is the foramen magnum. This line is C1. On the other side, you can see the structures. The cerebellum is here after we open the dura. The tonsils 
were down here, meaning the, the level of C1 and the tip of the tonsil is way below C1 and the brainstem is down here. Okay, As long as the brainstem and tonsil go down further more and more, the Chiari is going to be more severe. So, the debate regarding doing bony decompression or opening the dura, uh, if you do only the bony part, uh, meaning that you take out the bone, you take the ligaments, and you take some ligament, uh, some dural adhesion uh, around the front and magnum, uh, making more space. Uh, if you open up the dura, you do a more extensive decompression, uh, and when you do more extensive decompression, meaning that you have a greater chance to maybe have more uh, risks and morbidities. So this little table and now uh, give a comparison, nice comparison of both of them. The FMD alone meaning just the bony part. Uh, FMD with the T, we open up the dura, maybe shrink up the tonsils. Surgical time, if it's only bone, it's going to be shorter. Less, uh, the blood loss is going to be uh, very small in both surgeries. Um, the surgical risk is going to be uh, greater when you open up the dura and you are uh, walking around the tonsils because of the blood vessels that are there, the brainstem and the spinal cord. Uh, ICU, when we do in this institute uh, bony decompression, we usually we just send the patient uh, to the floor, regular floor, uh, and they maybe two days after they will go home. If we open up the dura, usually they will go to the ICU uh, for 24 hours and will stay uh, between one to two days furthermore than just the bony decompression. Um, in regard to C the risk for CSF leak, if you don't open the dura, it's very rare. If you open the dura, the risk is much greater, uh, although altogether is small. Uh, and the need for further decompression, meaning you did the surgery, but the symptoms either came back or just stayed there. Uh, when you do only the bony decompression, the, the chances are higher, but it still gives you a second chance to make things better. If you did the full surgery, the open up the dura and the tonsillar shrinks, it's very rare to have it, uh, to have the patient coming back, but in maybe more uh, morbidities and risks. In terms of complication, we just talked about uh, reoperation. When you do bonely only, there is a chance you will need to take the patient again for surgery. Still, it's very low. Uh, when you open up the door, you have more uh, a higher risk uh, for uh, morbidities uh, after surgery. There is a thing that we call a septic meningitis, meaning it, it's not a real meningitis. There is not a uh, positive microbiology. Uh, it's something related to a chemical reaction uh, or inflammation that the body uh, cause re uh, in regard to the surgery or uh, coagulation material we use. Uh, the percentage can be high, but eventually the treatment is time and uh, sometimes steroids and rest. Um, CSF leak, when you open up the dura, can be up to 10%. Today is much less than that. Altogether, the risk from doing KRD compression is fairly low. I'm going to skip this one. We talked about the scoliosis. One thing that I want to uh, emphasize in scoliosis, it's all about when you cut it. If the kid came with scoliosis uh, and has Chiari, you need to address the Chiari first. The chances for the uh, scoliosis to, uh, to disappear are there, but uh, are relate to the time and uh, the severity of scoliosis when you diagnose the Chiari and did the operation. Um, if it's too severe, eventually the kid or the adult will need uh, further treatment in regard to scoliosis. In terms of syrinx, we saw that in Chiari 1 it's uh, fairly common to have syrinx. We know today, in, in the past, you see the numbers here in the middle, uh, there was a lot of uh, syrinx, uh, syringo, uh, syrinx shunt procedures between the syringo uh, hydromyelia to uh, other channels like the subarachnoid or even 
pleural or peritoneal. Today we rarely do these procedures because we know that if we do going to do a good foramen magnum decompression, uh, most of the serum is going to be resolved. If not resolved completely, the symptoms are going to be uh, um, better with time. And a question being asked, what if the syrinx went down but still there and still symptoms? You can go back and do another decompression or if you did only bony, open up the dura and do a more extensive surgery and leave uh, the chance, the syrinx chance, as a last uh, result. In terms of hospital management, I talked about it before. Uh, when it's bony only, we tend to send to the floor. It's minimal stay in the hospital. We usually, uh, the patient doing well. It's mainly pain from the muscle spasm. We treat that with uh, a medication like Valium, and they go home. Uh, when we op open up the dura, we tend to send them to the ICU for 24 hours. Uh, they have a little bit more pain, uh, still just simple medication. Sometimes uh, the use of uh, a pain team with a pump uh, in order to make them uh, ease the pain after surgery, but altogether they do well as well. So a little bit imaging. This is the pre-op imaging. Uh, you always need to look for the full picture. You cannot focus only on that because the syrinx can be much lower, like thoracic syrinx when you have Chiari. doesn't need to be here. Uh, we measure, we see the tonsillar uh, descent, we uh, check for the symptoms and the clinical symptoms and go further from here. So we saw the picture before, that's what it looked after decompression. Uh, so you saw the tonsillar descent up to here and after decompression, you see the white here is CSF, the tonsillar up. This being done not the day after, that's going to take a while. It's a few months after surgery when all the system get back to normal uh, and the tonsils sometimes go up enough to be shown like that and sometimes the symptoms just uh, went away and the radio radiological picture is still impressive but there are no symptoms, so you did your job. In terms of complication, we saw the complication are not uh, very severe, yet you need to uh, treat around the clock uh, after the surgery, you need to uh, treat the pain, uh, especially the muscle spasm. Um, sometimes, very rarely, we have a hematoma uh, under the skin, under the scalp, uh, and a CSF leak as well. Um, all of these potential problems are very rare these days with a uh, new technique and uh, the approach that we use, we rarely see this after surgery. So, in terms of uh, post-op relation complication, uh, we talked about uh, the common like CSF leak hematoma, uh, and we're going to talk about a few less common. One of them is hydrocephalus. Uh, Dr. Tewitt is going to address that as well in his uh, talk. Uh, sometimes kids with uh, after carry decompression uh, can come a few days after, uh, sometimes even a few weeks after, with development of hydrocephalus, sometimes with some kind of subdural collection around the cerebellum. Uh, we see that. Uh, it's not very common, but uh, it's not it's not very rare uh, eventually the treatment can be done only with uh, medication like damox steroids uh, lower head position and a lot of patience especially for the surgeon meaning that you're not going in and doing another opening or putting in a shunt because usually it will resolve So, in terms of uh, long-term um, complication, um, CSF leak can come long-term after surgery, sometimes, usually within, in relate to infection. 
scoliosis as we talk uh, if you do, if you didn't catch it, uh, catch it on time uh, will need to be addressed uh, later on for treatment um, when the Chiari is uh, with a very low descent uh, and you need to do a, a very extensive bony decompression uh, sometimes even C2 uh, those kids sometimes will need an OC fusion, occipital cervical fusion uh, because they develop uh, bony malformation of their cervical spine and I mentioned before the basilar invagination uh, into uh, the brainstem, the lower brainstem uh, those uh, spe uh, patients specifically uh, need to be uh, followed carefully because even after doing the curative decompression, there is a problem here that may be um, a sign for some kind of instability in their upper cervical spine and they will need uh, to be fixed with fusion later on. Remember what I said before, look at this picture, you see the Chiari, maybe if you look very hard you can see a start of syrinx here, but if you do the full scan like you should, you see syrinx uh, lower than the spot that you looked before. In terms of sleep apnea, uh, this is a problem that uh, go in association with Chiari and can be uh, with re uh, relieved with great success after uh, QR decompression and always remember don't be fooled by one picture look at the vast uh, look at the full picture this kid maybe a little syrinx here or a start of syrinx if you look down uh, there is a QR not very impressive but this is the same kid uh, with a vast syrinx or hypermalia and scoliosis and need to be treated um, with QRD compression, maybe with scoliosis surgery as well. So in conclusion, we know today a lot about Chiari, much more than we did before, uh, yet controversy still go on. Uh, we don't know yet if the different Chiari uh, that we mentioned, like Chiari 0, 1, 1 1.5 and, and so on, came from the same origin, same uh, etiology or different and we still call them Chiari and maybe in the future they will call in different names. Um, we're still debating regarding which is the best treatment to begin with. If it's, is it just opening up the bone or do we need to open uh, the dura? Or maybe there is a scale of when you need to open just the bone or maybe to do a more extensive surgery. Thank you very much. That was excellent. I think uh, that was an excellent clinical talk uh, by uh, Nir about Curie malformations. I think we're going to follow it with um, Dr. Tewitt uh, to share his thoughts about uh, the current state of uh, Chiari malformations, um, as well as the the current research investigations uh, for these uh, uh, for this uh, disorder, Dr. Tewitt, as everyone knows um, or is familiar with, has been in the uh, Tampa St. Pete area for 20 plus years, and uh, was uh, probably w was the first board certified pediatric neurosurgeon in the region, um, and has been on the forefront in many. Uh, neurosurgical conditions uh, uh, such as craniosynostosis, brain tumors, endoscopy, uh, as well as uh, Chiari uh, malformations. Um, besides being a master surgeon, um, he, he, he has significant publications in both uh, Chiari malformations as well as uh, uh, leading our research efforts in Chiari uh, disorders and cerebral myelia. Dr. Tewitt. Okay, everybody. Well, I'll try to keep you awake. I'm Jerry Tewitt, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about research related to Chiari. Um, so what, when I was given this opportunity, I thought, well, you know, I think I'll just review all of the Chiari research and give a nice overview of all research. And then I did a PubMed search and found about 10,000 articles. And I said, this is overwhelming. So. Um, instead, I thought I would give you an update on research that's being done here. 
um, at All Children's Hospital and, um, and then have an opportunity to open things up to questions. Let's see. So, uh, carry malformation worldwide is very active. As I mentioned, there are lots of papers published every week uh, on this topic and investigators all over the world are looking into things like why does Chiari happen? Like, is it a genetic problem? Is it related to spina bifida? Is it related to environmental things? We all think it's probably just congenital, but believe me, there's a lot of research being done uh, at the molecular level, looking at genes and all different aspects of why this actually occurs. There are also uh, studies on just the, the engineering of Chiari malformation. Why does it happen? Is it simply just a bony problem in the back of the head, or is it really having to do with flow of fluid, or is it a combination of things? As Nir said, uh, there are lots of different symptoms that have been attributed to Chiari, uh, but sometimes it's a little murky. Uh, people are trying to specify what symptoms are most likely to be related. What we're interested in as surgeons is the type of thing like uh, who requires surgery and what kind of surgery should be done? What should we do with the syrinx in the spinal cord? Those are all topics that we could, we could talk all day about each one of these topics. Um, uh, and it's great to see so much research being done in organizations like this organization trying to push things forward and helping to facilitate research around the world. So we're glad to be here and participate in this. So uh, research here at Johns Hopkins All Children's has really accelerated over the past um, decade, really the past five years. Uh, because Johns Hopkins came and bought our hospital, and of course Johns Hopkins is a worldwide known uh, res leader in research throughout the world, and uh, they brought a clinical and translational research organization to the hospital, which in my opinion was the best thing they did uh, at this hospital, and it's uh, run by a man named Neil Goldenberg, who actually was a resident, uh, or no, he trained in this area, and then Sharon Gazarian, she's a statistician, Ernest Amankwa, uh, he's a statistician as well, and then it's all led by our president and CEO, Jonathan Ellen. So they put this organization in place um, a while ago, and things have really flourished. Um, in relation to surgical type research, which we're most interested in, and I'll focus on today, uh, there are four attending neurosurgeons here. Dr. Jell leads us, and there's Dr. Kerry, Dr. Rodriguez, and myself. And then Nir is a fellow, and we have residents from USF. Uh, we have a big team. And then, uh, of course, we have a nurse coordinator who you have met. Lisa, she's sitting back there. More on her later. So I'm going to talk about local research that has been done by our team, and then research as part of a big national team. Okay. So I need to embarrass Dr. Jallo a little bit here. Uh, before we were able to convince Dr. Jallo to come down here and lead us, I had read many of his papers for many years because I'm very interested in Chiari as well. And uh, he actually has written many of the most important papers on Chiari treatments in kids uh, over the past 20 years or so. Um, like here was an early one that he wrote with one of his mentors. Uh, from New York, and you can see it was 66 operations, which at the time was a lot of, of operations. Um, and it was just a description of, of uh, their experience. I don't know why this isn't moving, sorry. Uh, and then here's another paper he wrote about what Nir was talking about. Remember he said, Nir said, if you treat Chiari malformation, you can help treat scoliosis. Well, we've known that for many years, and George was one of the first people to really nail the idea that you need to treat the scoliosis early before the scoliosis progresses before uh, past about 40 degrees or so. So he did that back in 2008, but uh, it's really an important paper and, and, uh, and it just illustrates how important research can be in the treatment of Chiari. Uh, he wrote another paper about a technical aspect of, uh, of Chiari surgery, how to close the dura. They're all different types of, of ways to do it. I don't even think he does this anymore, but at the time it was a, a novel idea. And then he also wrote a paper uh, that was very thoughtful. Uh, 256 uh, patients who underwent Chiari malformation looked at them after surgery. A lot of surgeons don't really pay attention to results after surgery, but he carefully went back and looked at a large group of patients. Because, and he, uh, the most important thing I got out of this paper was that, you know, not everybody has complete resolution of their symptoms after surgery. 
It's very common for people to still have some degree of headache throughout their life or other symptoms. Uh, and you can't expect complete resolution all the time. And some of you may be aware of that and familiar with that. Uh, he um, wrote this paper about whether or not to open the dura or not to open the dura and basing it on ultrasound and the position of the tonsils like uh, Dr. Shimoni was talking about, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. And even most recently, he published a great paper on uh, the treatment of Chiari when you open the dura, when Dr. Shimoni showed you those tonsils sticking down. Um, um, a lot of surgeons are fearful to sort of shrink those tonsils up, uh, but uh, George wrote a paper about how safe that is and how it was more effective in the treatment of syringomyelia. So George has really been a very active participant in the uh, Curie literature over the past 20 years, and we're lucky to have him here. We're still doing uh, some local research here. Uh, Dr. Carey, who's uh, in the operating room, is sort of spearheading an interesting project with Dr. Shimoni. He's our fellow. And then this is Dr. Vivas. He's a USF neurosurgery resident. Uh, and they're working on this project looking at um, uh, fluid collections that sometimes occur after Chiari surgery. I'll show you what, what I mean. And uh, Dr. Shimoni was kind enough to share these slides with me. These are MRIs like before surgery. Here's a Chiari malformation. Everybody see that? Um, and then after surgery, there's more room and you can see the surgical changes. And sometimes after surgery, after Chiari surgery, people get a buildup of fluid in the brain. On these pictures right here, you can see the brain and then the fluid, the white is fluid. You see the extra white around the brain. You can see it up on the top of the head and down in the back of the head, there's extra fluid. And for, uh, and for years, people have sometimes treated this with surgery because you can get pretty sick when you have some fluid build up like that. Uh, people have done surgery, put in drains and things like that. Um, but uh, our team started to use uh, medications instead in order to try and avoid surgery. Diamox is a medicine that reduces the production of spinal fluid and Decadron is a steroid. And if, give, if you give the two Ds, sometimes it can get people through and their symptoms can resolve and they never have to have any more surgery. Uh, so they're in the midst of uh, publishing this. Uh, and Dr. Shimoni has, has done a really nice job on that. So that'll add to the management of people uh, after carry malformation and hopefully will help avoid unnecessary surgery. So I'm trying to make very real contributions just locally. We have some other things going on, but those are two high, some of the highlights. Uh, we're very enthusiastic about uh, working as a team on research as well. As you can see, even George, who is one of the world experts on Chiari, uh, some of his publications had 66 patients, 256 patients. That, that's a lot for a single surgeon, but when you're trying to draw uh, conclusions about research based on such small numbers of patients, it can be hard because there's so many different things uh, that can vary between patients. So um, we try to participate in uh, research with other organizations and we've done so through the Syringomyelia uh, <coughs> Foundation. Uh, I forgot to mention uh, the University of Wisconsin. They had a study we participated in, uh, but we're currently participating uh, in two very important studies I think I thought I, thought I would tell you about. But the important part about these multi-institutional re research trials is that it requires teamwork, uh, but it allows us to compare ideas. Like We may have our own ideas, but the four of us working together, sometimes our ideas start to merge a little bit. We're involved in these multi-institutional research trials, and the nice part is, uh, with teamwork, we can compare ideas. We can get lots more patients, right, which helps us draw more conclusions. Um, it helps with statistics, you know, to have a lot more patients. It can minimize the amount of bias, like we have certain ideas, but other people might have different ideas and we can check each other. Uh, and we come up with more research ideas this way. So um, you've probably heard of the Park Reeves Syringomyelia Research Consortium. Anybody, have you heard of it? Okay. Um, well, it's, uh, it's pretty interesting. It is, uh, yeah, the, name's, the name is Park Reeves and Park comes from T.S. Park, this doctor down here on the bottom left. He's a neurosurgeon at Washington University in St. Louis. And then uh, the Reeves is Sam Reeves and his wife. He is a former cotton uh, businessman um, who had a relative who had Curie malformation. 
and he was grateful for all the help that Dr. Park gave his uh, granddaughter, actually, and uh, said, is there anything I can do? And Dr. Park said, yes, you could give us quite a bit of money to uh, do research, because before they did this, there were lots of people like George and other people doing research in smaller groups, but it was hard to get the information together, so it was hard to, to accumulate enough data. So the Park Reeves Consortium was started, I don't know, what was it, eight years ago now? 2010, yeah, so almost eight years ago. I mean, we're part of it. Uh, it's, uh, the, there's a person called a principal investigator. It's one person who's kind of in charge of all the research, and that's David Limbrick. Uh, that's the man on the left there. He's at Washington University. And then Lisa Tetro sitting over here. It's kind of a fuzzy picture. That's all I had. Uh, she is our local research coordinator uh, for the trial. Okay. And it's a big study. Uh, there are 47 centers all throughout the United States. They are generally big children's hospitals uh, that are used to doing research, so the data um, is, is good. So what is this consortium doing? Well, we want to look at all kinds of things related to QRE. In fact, Lisa can tell you whenever a patient and their family decides to enroll in in the consortium with us, they're asked a lot of questions. How many pages is the questionnaire for the it's consortium? Like 47 pages. 47 pages, we yeah. Pull that the medical record. <laughs> yeah. So there's a lot of data. Uh, we look at how often it happens, what the symptoms are, who should be treated, outcome from surgery. So it's not just surgical outcomes, it's all sorts of things. And patients are going to be followed for at least five years. And if someone else provides more money in the future, I'm sure that we will be able to follow these patients even longer. So our initial goal was to have a thousand patients and we've been part of this study from the very beginning. We were one of the first groups to jump on because we really believed in it. So our initial goal was a thousand patients. Well, we flew through that pretty quickly. We're at 1,300 patients already and our latest goal is 1,500 unless, you know, things change and more funding is available. Uh, and just think about it. Think of all the, all the great information we're going to have on 1,500 patients. Not only is it a large number of patients, but a lot of the data will be collected prospectively, meaning we, we get it as we go. And data on patients is much better in that way rather than looking back five years later and saying, oh, well, we wrote down here that they had headaches, but what, what didn't we write down? So we'll have much better prospective data on a lot of the patients, uh, we should have a lot of data, uh, and so there'll be lots of research papers written about this. Uh, to be in this uh, Park Reeves uh, consortium, uh, patients have to be 0 to 21 years of age. They have to have a Chiari malformation of at least 5 millimeters, and as Dr. Shimoni said, that's kind of a mild Chiari, but they also have to have a syrinx, a uh, fluid chamber in the spinal cord, of at least 3 millimeters. Uh, they need to be scheduled for surgery, and they have to have appropriate imaging, which is just standard. Uh, we don't include patients without a syrinx at this time. I suspect that sometime in the next 10 to 20 years, there'll be, a, uh, there'll be more consortiums like this to include patients with a QRE without syrinx. But we had to start somewhere. Um, and uh, it's all voluntary. Uh, if they don't want to be in the study, they don't need to be, but most people do. So within this consortium we've broken out the different groups of doctors that want to investigate different aspects of Chiari so there are all kinds of things we're looking at like the, we're looking at the bony anatomy um, at, at the base of the skull we're looking at quality of life issues long term and again that's why I think we'll need to follow this data even longer uh, we have a group of people just looking at the flow of fluid um, in the brain with, with the heartbeat like uh, Dr. Shimoni talked about. We have people only looking at MRIs and x-rays, and we have people looking at deformity of the spine after Chiari uh, surgery and how it affects um, their symptomatology <coughs> before and after surgery. So there are a lot of different projects that are coming down the pipe. Uh, here's one that was just published recently uh, looking at uh, the alignment of the spine. Uh, there's this line called the PBC2 line where we look at the base of the skull relative to the spine and how far back this little bone here uh, sticks back toward the brain stem. Um, and this was spearheaded by Dr. Hankinson in Colorado, but 
If you look at, uh, at the list of authors there, there are people from here, there are people from Colorado, there are people from St. Louis, there are people from Iowa, people from all over the country and the world <coughs> working on these sorts of projects. So we're getting some good information. The other nice thing about get, having a database like this is you really start thinking about things more critically and patients' contributions to this research is so helpful because they tell us what they're interested in and what, what matters to them. Um, we as scientists, uh, we strive to do the best research possible and as you may be aware, randomized prospective trials are the best ways to do research in a lot of different cases, uh, but they're hard to do unless you have a working group of people who can work collaboratively together. For example, as Dr. Shimoni said, there are different ways to do Chiari surgery. There is a bony decompression where uh, you just take off the bone at the base of the skull and you take it off the first lamina. Or you can also take off that bone and open up the dura like this, sort of like a book, uh, and put a patch of material over that. They're two totally different operations, as Dr. Shimoni um, alluded to. So which is better, right? We all have our opinion about this, but which is really better? Well, believe it or not, surgeons um, really don't agree on which is better. This was in a paper from 2011 where uh, Dr. Iskander from Wisconsin did sort of a questionnaire, gave us cases, and had neurosurgeons respond anonymously how they would treat things. And so on this particular case he gave us, 7% of the people said they would just remove the bone. And these are neurosurgeons that are specialized in pediatric neurosurgery. 36% said they'd take off the bone and open the dura. Another 27% said they would take off the bone, open the dura, and coagulate the tonsils, like Dr. Jallo wrote about. And 8% said they'd do something entirely different. So there's a lot of disagreement on, on how these different patients should be treated. So based on the work of the Park Reefs Consortium, Dr. Limbrick and in cooperation with our whole group of 47 centers applied for research funding from this patient, Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, which is a government agency to really promote better outcomes for people with surgery or with medicines or whatever. Uh, it's, it's the focus on patient outcomes. So uh, we were lucky enough to be granted almost a $3 million grant. Dr. Lembrick again is in charge of it, but all 47 centers are involved. And in that study, we're going to look at whether or not we just need to take off the bone or take off the bone and open the dura, like we talked about. Um, so we're going to randomize patients. It's kind of a different randomization, but in effect, they'll be randomized. Some centers will just do bone only. Other centers do bone on only plus duraplasty. And uh, by randomizing people, you know, between the different treatment arms, we'll get a much better idea of which treatment is effective. Because as it is now, most people just do the bone only when the Chiari is pretty mild, and the bone plus the duraplasty when the Chiari is more severe or the symptoms are worse. And so it's hard to compare the two. You're kind of comparing apples and oranges. So by randomizing, we'll get a much better idea. So in that study, similarly, the Chiari needs to be greater than five millimeters and the syrinx can be, is supposed to be sizable but not huge or minuscule, kind of an average size syrinx. Um, and this is a bunch of detail you don't really need to know. Uh, there are lots of reasons to be excluded from the study because we want to keep the patient population sort of like your typical patient with the Chiari and a syrinx. So that study will, is ongoing right now. We're participating in this, and uh, I don't expect any published results for several years, but it will really change the way that we treat patients with Chiari malformation. Research is all about teamwork, in my opinion, and, uh, and it's great to see organizations such as this and doctors around the country coming together to try and solve things cooperatively. This is another picture of Lisa. She's really integral to our our success in research here at Johns Hopkins All Children's. And if you decide to enroll in one of our studies, you'll get to know her very well. She's very good at what she does. Could I answer any questions at all? George. Is, are the 47 centers in the United States or? I think they're all in the US. Can you repeat the question? 
Oh, the question was, are the 47 centers for the Park Reeves Consortium in the United States? And I believe they're all in, in the United States, yes. So the next question, I guess, is, um, is there a comparable study, multi-institutional study being done in Europe that you're aware of? And the reason I ask is for people that may view this. Right, webinar. right. I am not aware of a similar consortium in Europe, are you? No. I don't believe there is. I mean, they have great studies going on in Europe for other things related to our field, but I do not know of one related to Curie specifically, but I could be wrong. Lisa, did you have anything to add to what I said? I you, do not at the moment. Okay. Um, just that research is voluntary, but I think that most patients really want to know more and want to help in any way that they can, and they do get involved, which is great. What she said was research, it really is voluntary, but the vast majority of people, we rarely have anybody say they don't want to participate because there's no added risk uh, in general to being involved in these research studies. And we are glad the Curie community is rallying behind our, our efforts. Well, thanks everybody for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.